Welcome back to the Taurus Report, the bull in the china shop of cosmology. Today we're going to look at some objections that have been made to CGC, cyclic gravity and cosmology, and what my response to those objections are. The first thing we're going to take a look at is uh, something called the bullet cluster, uh, which uh, GR LCDM theorists have often put forward as uh, the smoking gun that proves uh, that dark matter exists. So we need to take a careful look at this because I believe CGC provides an, a uh, very viable alternative explanation for what we're seeing in the bullet cluster. And then we'll go on to discuss a few other objections and my responses to those. If you open up a browser and you just type in bullet cluster, then you should be able to find this Wikipedia article on it. And it uh, explains pretty well all about it and what its meaning uh, is, its significance to the dark matter debate. And I'm going to explain that very carefully. Uh, I'd also like to remind everyone you can get to my website by typing in taurusreport.com, taurusreport, all as one word, dot com. And this will bring you to my website. If you scroll down a little bit, you can get to my paper on cyclic gravity and cosmology, CGC, and download a copy of that. Or you can just look at it in the browser window. And I discuss the bullet cluster as well uh, in the paper at some length and its significance to this discussion about uh, the existence of dark matter. So let's see, where is that in my paper? That is here, so section 17, what about the bullet cluster? So I'm going to get into that at some length now. Before we discuss the bullet cluster, however, we must have a basic understanding of what we mean by uh, gravitational lensing. Uh, it's not that complicated. If you have, uh, like, let's say this is the Earth. And let's say you have some massive galaxy or galaxy cluster uh, in the foreground here. Then, according to general relativity, this massive object, in this case, in the case of the bullet cluster, we're talking about a cluster of galaxies. So this massive object is going to bend light, uh, just like a magnifying glass does. And the reason it bends light, according to general relativity, gravity does not act directly on light. So according to general relativity, what is happening here, this bending of light, uh, is that this massive object is bending space, and then light follows the curvature of space. So gravity does not act upon light directly. Rather, light uh, follows the curved path. And so you get a certain amount of what's called lensing. And what we mean by that, all we mean by it is that the path of the light bends. And we can see that. And uh, it's called lensing because it can magnify objects behind it, just like a, uh, just the way a, len a, a lens works. Um, a le an actual, like a glass lens or something will refract light. Um, but in the end, it's kind of the same thing. Basically, it changes the path of light, so things in, in the background can be magnified. And we call this gravitational lensing. Now, what is... Now, uh, uh, let's see, before I get to the bullet cl cluster, one more thing to take uh, note of is to remind you that in CGC... CGC also posits that a gravity well will indirectly bend light, but it's a completely different mechanism, not through the bending of space. Okay, so how does CGC account for that? We discussed that already, 
And here's a picture in uh, section 14. Um, was it section 14? Yeah, somewhere in section 14. A, uh, what is posited in CGC is that any large gravity source like the sun will attract increasing uh, density of uh, cold neutrinos. And with current technology, cold neutrinos cannot be detected at all. But they have an effect that we do observe, which is that like any density gradient, it will refract light. So the gravity attracts neutrinos, it creates this density gradient, and therefore light when it goes by, uh, the path of the light is bent, not by gravity attracting it, but rather as an indirect effect of the existence of that gravity well. So coming back to what we were saying about uh, lensing uh, that we see in telescopes, uh, so the effect is the same. So under general relativity, we'd expect light to come from some background object. The mass of object in the foreground bends the path. We can observe that bent path, and we call that gravitational lensing. Now under general relativity, that is caused by this mass of object bending space and light following that bent path. And under CGC, there is a density gradient of neutrinos, and this density gradient causes the refraction of light. So under CGC, it's much more like a regular lens. Now, what's going on with a bullet cluster? I need to do a few more drawings. This is what has happened. We look at lensing. Now, um, what many people might not know or what is counterintuitive, when we think of something like a galaxy, uh, we think of most of the mass of, uh, and I'm talking about visible mass. So for a moment, let us forget about uh, dark matter and pretend it doesn't exist and just talk about the visible mass of a galaxy, and I'm talking about uh, including like gas and dust, even if it is transparent gas, like let's say it's transparent gas, even if it's transparent, I am still kind of declaring that visible matter, meaning, I, I mean that it's normal matter, even if it's transparent, it's normal, it's not dark matter, that's what I'm saying. And so if we consider all of the normal matter in a galaxy, by far most of the matter is gas, uh, you know, a kind of transparent dust and gas that's in between all the stars of the galaxy and, and surrounding the galaxy. And I'm talking about normal matter uh, that is just either in a yeah, gaseous state or, or else it's... Uh, uh, ionized hydrogen uh, ion, uh, ions. Yeah. So I'm talking about normal matter. Most of the mass in a galaxy is that. It's gaseous. And people tend to think of most of the matter in a galaxy uh, or the matter in an intergalactic space as if uh, it's mostly contains in, in stars, and that's not true. So what happens in the bullet cluster? cluster? What we have here is two massive objects, um, uh, two galaxy clusters uh, that collided. So we have uh, one galaxy cluster that runs into another galaxy cluster. So they run into each other and then they bypassed each other. Okay, so you've got two galaxy clusters running into each other. So two very massive objects. So they run into each other. And so here's after they pass. Now, as far as normal matter, uh, here is the thing. All of the stars, like the visible stars, they just pass right by each other and they don't touch. The odds of two stars colliding, when two galaxies collide, the odds of two stars colliding are minuscule. It just doesn't happen. 
Okay, so the galaxies kind of pass through each other without any trouble. And it looks like, you know, they just pass through each other and there's no problem. The, the visible stars, I mean. However, all of the gas and dust in the galaxies, the, the galaxy clusters, when they collide, they do end up getting hung up on each other. And because they end up getting hung up on each other, they sort of get separated from the visible stuff. So here you could say visible stars in the galaxies. Here and here. So the two clusters, they pass right through each other and kept going. And so you have visible stars here and here. Then here in the middle, what you have is gas and dust. Gas and dust. And once again, in this discussion so far, I am not even talking about dark matter and not even considering it. I'm pretending it does not exist. So I'm only talking about normal matter, you know, dust and gas or stars made of normal matter that uh, we are used to dealing with in our day-to-day uh, -day life and physicists have dealt with in particle accelerators and so forth. So the visible stars end up here and here, and in the middle you end up with all the gas and dust. So far, so good. So what's the problem? When we look at gravitational lensing, because most of the mass of the clusters, most of the mass must be where the dust and gas is. In other words, that all got hung up on each other. That all collided with each other. Even though the stars did not, the stars just passed right through each other. But the dust and gas doesn't just pass right through. It all gets hung up on the dust and gas from the other cluster. Now, this is where most of the mass should be. This is where most of the mass should be. Yet, when we look at gravitational lensing, the lensing that we are seeing is saying that most of the mass is where the visible stars are. And that is the problem. We observe most of the lensing here and here, where the visible stars are, and we do not see as much lensing. There's still some lensing, but we don't see as much lensing where the dust and gas is, and this is where most of the normal matter is. This is where most of the normal matter is. And so uh, GRLCDM theorists, they say, well, this is a smoking gun. If most of the lensing is here, that means most of the mass is here. That means there must be most of the mass is dark matter. Because dark matter, having the characteristic that it does not interact at all except for uh, with gravity, like it does not react electromagnetically at all. And because of that, it also would pass through the collision unscathed. It also would pass through without being hung up with uh, dark matter or ordinary matter from the other galaxy cluster. And it would pass through and it would end up where the visible stars are. So you'd end up with dark matter here and here in this collision. And here and here. So you'd end up with dark matter and visible stars here and here. This is where most of the gravitational lensing occurs. Therefore, dark matter exists. And this is one of the major uh, uh, items that are used to kind of prove the existence of dark matter. Now, how can CGC explain the same uh, observation? And it relates to what I just showed earlier, the idea of increasing neutrino density. Um, so according to CGC, this is what happens. This is what happens. And let me go back to the drawing here. So let's draw, I'm going to save this little drawing and maybe refer back to it. But let's say what's happening in CGC. In CGC, you have some massive galaxy cluster, and there will be a neutrino gradient around it with a certain amount of 
of gravitational lensing caused by this neutrino gradient around it. Here is another galaxy cluster, same thing. It has a neutrino gradient around it, and that neutrino gradient causes gravitational lensing. So then these two collide. Now, when the uh, stars pass through, they pass through unscathed, and around each star, or, or around all what we would call, uh, you know, highly visible uh, matter, or, you know, a, a matter that is a light source. That's what I mean by, by a star. So uh, dust and gas uh, is not really a light source. It's obviously matter. Um, so sometimes when I use the word visible, that's what I mean, is that it's the, the stars. So what's going to happen is these stars... They pass through, so if these two clusters collide, moving in opposite directions, right, they're going to pass through, and the stars will have a smaller quantity of neutrinos than before. Why will they have a smaller quantity of neutrinos? They will have a smaller quantity of neutrinos because a lot of the neutrinos got hung up with the uh, collision of the dust and gas in the center. Now, because you have all these dust and gas molecules moving at high velocities in opposite directions, and they're getting hung up with each other, what happens is, instead of a highly organized and, uh, um, how shall I say it, uh, well, I guess organized is a good word, although that implies intent, and I'm not trying to imply intent here, um, a uh, structured layer of neutrinos here, when the dust and gas collides, you end up with all kinds of uh, little gatherings of dust and gas, and the, the nice organized layers all get chaotically thrown into chaos, okay? Because the dust and gas gets hung up on each other and starts uh, colliding and moving off and heading every which way. And so what I'm saying is that all of the neutrino gradient that was associated with the dust and, gra and gas, instead of looking nice and neat like this, because of the collision, it all this uh, orderliness all gets destroyed. And so what this means is that the... Um, the, the dust and gas, uh, the neutrino gradient where the dust and gas is, because it does not stay nice and or organized, you do not have the massive uh, uh, lensing effect that you would be expecting. So you end up with a nice gradient only around the visible matter which passes through relatively unscathed. And so where most of the mass is, yes, most of the mass is here, but remember, um, mass does not bend light directly. It refracts light based on the neutrino gradient. And if that gradient is destroyed or randomized and does not have structure, so it's not in a clear gradient anymore, but really scattered all over the place, then you're not going to have the same lensing that you have here and here. And so this is CGC's explanation for why there's more lensing with the visible stars than there is with the dust and gas. So, in my opinion, CGC is well able to explain what is going on with a bullet uh, cluster without resorting to uh, uh, dark matter to explain it. Now, one other objection I deal with often, and I have mentioned this before, but it bears mentioning again, is that uh, GRLCDM theorists will complain or criticize in the sense that they say, well, you don't have a force law that can uh, predict motions in every circumstance. To which I answer, um, that is true. That is true. But 
CGC does explain why such a force law uh, would be difficult or impossible to come up with right now. In other words, yes, I am not able to come up with a simple and elegant law that can predict gravity in all environments. And so we must rely on Newtonian or general relativity uh, to do that for now, even though we can see clearly they don't apply in all circumstances. Now, someone subscribing to GR might claim that it does apply, that GR does apply in all circumstances. And I just think that if you need to make up unobserved things like dark matter and you need to put it in shapes and concentrations and densities and places throughout the universe in an ad hoc way in order to make everything predictable, then in a way you're approaching things ad hoc in your own way. I mean, um, the a simple and elegant uh, force law of GR cannot match observations unless it does that. Same thing with cosmological expansion. So with cosmological expansion, yes, CGC conceptually accounts for it only by referencing forces we already know the electromagnetic force, the strong and weak nuclear forces. And so CGC conceptually can explain cosmological expansion and galactic rotation rates without the resorting to um, what I consider to be other fictional things. Um, so with general relativity, cosmological expansion also is done at varying rates uh, wherever needed. Uh, in my opinion, inflation is just a, another way of saying, hey, we need a different expansion rate early on uh, to explain the uh, matter distribution in the universe. And then even later, we have a, a different rate. And now they're talking about to... Uh, to um, deal with the... Uh, co the recent uh, controversy about the Hubble constant, they're talking about a dynamic rate that changes here and there. And all it means is that they're just declaring whatever rate they need in whatever era they need it to make general relativity work. Uh, to me, that is even more arbitrary because CGC just explains why the gravitational force law for now, we're stuck with just looking at observations and saying, look, in this region, in this context, with these objects, gravity is behaving this way. And we're data fitting, I admit that. And you just plot it and say, this is how gravity behaves in this context. But we suspect it's behaving that way because of the CGC explanation, but the, the very nature of the CGC explanation is impossible to, uh, to calculate at this time. Another objection I frequently deal with is the claim that CGC does not make testable predictions. Now, this is just plain false. Now, I would like to share some predictions that I have made that I found uh, uh, were proven true after I uh, investigated them. Um, well, I'll talk about those. Then I will uh, uh, present several other tests uh, that might be done to uh, disprove CGC or to allow it to continue to stand. So first, some of the predictions that I made, and I'd like the viewer to understand that when I made the prediction, uh, in other words, when I went looking for this, I did not know about these things. Now, a, a professional astrophysicist might have said 
that it's not a prediction if we already knew it. And all I can say is, hey, it was a prediction for me because I didn't know it. Uh, one thing that I predicted was that if gravity behaved in the way that I claim, there would be a, a strong uh, pressure, a natural pressure, for objects that are interacting for a long time, there would be a pressure towards circular orbits. And there would be a pressure uh, for circular orbits, and there would be a pressure for shells in the sense that there would be certain discrete distances wherein most orbits would lie. And uh, over time, over a long time, most orbits would be pressured or tend towards circular, even if they did not start that way. Now, when I thought about this, I said to myself, well, now that being the case, doesn't it make sense that over the course of billions and billions of years, the some galaxies might have accomplished a circular uh, shape. So I went looking for that, and what I found is stuff like this. If you type in uh, ring galaxies, okay, you type that up, and then you uh, find things like this, Hoag's object. Now here's a, a, grav a galaxy that is in the shape of a circle. Now, Various uh, general relativity or, or GRLCDM uh, theorists, or basically most professional astrophysicists, they try to explain this, you know, by uh, two galaxies colliding, like one galaxy uh, plowed out a hole in the middle of another galaxy. And I don't think that's the case. I think that this is just a long-term trend over time. Uh, galaxies, if they're in a system where they're not dynamically being um, uh, messed up by uh, other galaxies within a cluster. So over time, if they're kind of undisturbed, they're going to end up in this sort of circular shape. And I note that also with, uh, if we look at, if you type in something like uh, elliptical galaxies have shells, okay? Then you find stuff like, uh, and look, they always say it's the result of, of collisions. I, th I find that funny. Uh, I'm saying it's not the result of collisions, okay? I'm saying that over time, an undisturbed object uh, like this will develop shells because there's a strong bias towards circular orbits because those are stable. And this is why uh, another uh, prediction that I made related to this allowed me to discover Molnia orbits, which I've, I've talked about before in this uh, series. The Russians experimented with satellites in very extreme elliptical orbits around the Earth. And they had difficulty keeping those orbits stable. Now, all um, traditional theorists would say that, uh, you know, it's because of the influence of the moon or some other reason why these extremely elliptical orbits are not stable in the sense of tracing out easily the same exact path all the time. Now, under Newtonian or general relativity, we would expect that very uh, elliptical orbits like those of comets would be stable and be able to trace out the same path each time, naturally. And under CGC, that's not the case. Um, those kinds of orbits are not stable and they're not going to trace out the same path. And so according to CGC, this is why the Russians with their Molnia orbits, why it just kind of didn't work out. It took too much work to keep this, the satellite on, a, on, a, on the same path all the time. Whereas with circular orbits, uh, uh, it's not a problem. Now, Now, those predictions I 
mentioned they might be disallowed because someone can say that I found all that stuff before I predicted it. You know, whatever. I, I mean, I still think it very well explains what we see in these cases. But how about uh, proposing experiments that might actually be done? There are several different things uh, that might be done. Uh, first, CGC claims that the cosmic microwave background radiation is caused by uh, uh, light leaving galaxies, going to the outer edge of the universe, which is uh, uh, ionized hydrogen and uh, possibly helium. I, I, you know, I don't know <laughs> what's out there. But my point is that going to the outer reaches of the universe... And then if it travels far enough in this medium, now I call this the intergalactic medium, but it's kind of different than the uh, regular intergalactic medium. The, the regular intergalactic medium is the stuff like in between galaxies, uh, you know, uh, ionized uh, dust and gas and, and whatever. Now, the intergalactic medium I'm talking about would be on the outer edge of the universe and extends who knows how far where there uh, are no stars. And this, this intergalactic medium I am claiming through Compton and reverse Compton scattering. And then the long journey of light there and the long journey of light back uh, in essence means that the cosmic microwave background radiation is starlight that has been converted. Now we know from its black body spectrum that it's not uh, direct starlight, like uh, it's not stuff that's coming from a star that's incredibly far away uh, because it doesn't have the right profile. But it could be starlight that has been Compton or reverse Compton scattered in the outer reaches and then come back to us. So what does that have to do with the prediction? I am claiming that uh, someone may be able to build some kind of box with the medium that we speculate is out there and then just see, take a look at the wavelengths uh, of light that are sent into this black body box and then look at light after it is Compton and reverse Compton scattered out of that box and then simply do some calculations and see if it traveled the incredible distances we're talking about, number one. And if those incredible distances, uh, it is subject to tired light. And again, I discussed how, um, uh, uh, once again, to refer to a previous episode, I explained that uh, it has been proven to my satisfaction that tired light cannot explain uh, all of the red shifting that we see. Uh, so this means that uh, most distance galaxies are indeed in CGC accelerating away from us. CGC doesn't allow the uh, stretching of space, and so under CGC those galaxies are actually accelerating away from us. But I do think that tired light is part of the explanation. Now, as far as the huge red shifting of the CMB, the source of that light is far beyond uh, any galaxy or star. And so the uh, tired light effect from that place, however far the edge of the universe is, would be uh, tremendous if CGC is right about this uh, a view of tired light. So in other words, uh, if we built a uh, black body box containing within it uh, whatever uh, dust, gas, uh, ionized uh, atoms that we posit might exist in the intergalactic medium, and we send uh, starlight into there and then see if Compton or reverse Compton scattering will uh, have it come out in such a way that if tired light is correct at those distances, it would account for the CMB coming to us from all those directions. So that is uh, one experiment that might be done. Now, going back to what I was saying about Molia orbits earlier, uh, 
this time uh, we might send uh, probes or satellites deliberately into such an orbit. Uh, this time with the equipment to really analyze the gravitational force uh, at all points on this Molniya orbit. And by Molniya orbit, I mean if here's the Earth, you send a satellite at uh, into a very, very elliptical orbit and then uh, watch the behavior of gravity at all points along that orbit while trying to account for the gravitational effect of the moon and the sun and so forth. Uh, and just see if there are uh, minute variations in the gravitational force that GR or uh, Newtonian gravity cannot explain but would make sense under CGC. And the same thing uh, goes with comets. Now, we already know, because comets are a light source, and we can track them very well, we already know that they seem to display what are called non-gravitational uh, acceleration, meaning they move as if they're not only under the source of gravity, uh, Newtonian or, or general relativity gravity, and scientists account for that by claiming that there's off-gassing. And this off-gassing is like a propellant that makes comets behave, you know, in an unpredictable way. And that is called non-gravitational acceleration. Uh, I think a probe might be sent to try and track a comet's orbit and maybe observe it much more closely to see if indeed off-gassing is happening in a way that explains these accelerations because I believe that in fact most off-gassing on a body like that would be pretty much the same in all directions um, and so I don't think that it would account for this uh, non-gravitational acceleration especially if as under CGC uh, if we observe these things very carefully, we might see that the variations in acceleration follow a wave-like pattern um, as the object travels quickly, radially, uh, towards the sun. So, uh, again, when I use the, the phrase uh, uh, radially, I mean a path going like directly at the sun. Now, uh, comets don't go directly at it, but I mean, kind of. They kind of go in an elliptical orbit like that. And so a motion like that, we call it radial, like the spokes of a, of, of a, of a bicycle, as opposed to an orbital motion. If you have uh, like an orbital motion, it'd be kind of like this. Radial motion means going directly at the center. And I am claiming that under CGC, if we look at these radial motions, in our solar system, we will see minute variations in gravity that are consistent with that predicted by CGC. This applies to comets. It also applies to satellites, which is why CGC claims the results of uh, the flyby anomaly and the pioneer anomaly um, are explainable under CGC. Going back to what we were talking about as far as the cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB, another way that would make CGC much more likely is if theorists would move on from Pardo's work that I mentioned in my paper and tried to explain the power spectrum of the CMB and the distribution of matter in the universe with a model that adopts a CGC-like uh, explanation of gravity to see if uh, we can duplicate that power spectrum. I mean, a lot of effort was gone into doing that where theorists would tweak the quantity, you know, as I did in a previous episode, I think, forget episode three or four, something like that, where theorists would tweak the quantities of... Um, dark energy and dark matter and so forth to see if it resulted in a power spectrum that matched what we see in the CMB. 
And so they were able to play with those parameters and have it match up pretty well, you know, with the Hubble expansion rate and with the amount of dark matter we need for galactic rotation rates. And so because those things match, they kind of assume they're on the right track. Well, I speculate that a theorist working with the assumptions under CGC will be able to make the power spectrum of the uh, CMB match as well. So I would like to see some modeling uh, uh, to see if this can be done. Now, another thing that I would like to... Uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, another thing I like to see investigated is right now the technology that in my opinion is closest to be able to conclusively demonstrate uh, CGC would be nuclear magnetic resonance imaging and that is because CGC is claiming that gravity comes from cyclic motions of charges within the nuclei of atoms and that uh, some tiny microscopic amount of these, you know, one in trillions, just happen to match up enough so it's like two parallel wires in phase and they experience this attractive force of gravity. And we already kind of look at that sort of thing with nuclear magnetic resonance uh, imaging, NMR. Um, and I'm just wondering if someone who is in that field or theorists who are in that field might take a look at the claims here at CGC and see if some of that equipment can be adapted to detect uh, what I'm talking about. Now, a major problem with that, and it is quite a big problem, is that NMR uh, is dealing with uh, a larger version of charges, like it's the number of, uh, of uh, protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And I forget, um, uh, I, I think for uh, NMR, you need like an odd number of protons or an odd number of neutrons or something like that. I forget exactly. But my point is that the charges and magnetic forces they're looking at in NMR are a very large scale up from what I'm talking about. So they are talking about uh, massive particles, uh, protons and neutrons. I am claiming charge fluctuations among quarks which is a whole different scale. So I don't know if that's possible for that technology to be adapted like that or not, um, but I'm hoping it is. Now, uh, the other interesting aspect of this is, let's suppose uh, someone's able to do that. Someone's able to adapt NMR to that scale, uh, charge fluctuations among quarks. If that were possible, then theoretically anti-gravity would be possible because if you can somehow cause these fluctuations to be anti-phase with whatever the uh, overall fluctuation going on uh, that gives items gravity on earth uh, that gives items gravitational attraction on earth if you can at any point uh, be anti-phase for that well then that would be anti-gravity. Uh, so under this theory, anti-gravity uh, would be theoretically possible. That is everything I wanted to discuss with you in this episode. The next episode, I would like to bring to, to a conclusion uh, this talk about the theory of CGC. And then the Taurus Report will then move more into looking at items in the news uh, related to astrophysics, related to the observations of the Webb Telescope, and present them to you in summarized form. But before I move on to that, the last episode of, I guess I'll call it this season, although I will be continuing to have episodes every week, uh, this last episode will be 
some fairly harsh criticism of the state of astrophysics uh, general, uh, in general right now, and an appeal to mainstream uh, theorists to try to move in a different direction, an appeal to them to move in a direction where we don't have to rely upon things like dark matter, dark energy, uh, inflation, things that we have no way of observing and no possible way of falsifying. And so my next episode will be a, a harsh criticism of all that, followed by an appeal uh, to the field to move in a different direction. Thank you very much for watching this week, uh, and we will see you next week uh, for the next edition of the Taurus Report. Goodbye for now.